Julian, and uh, I uh, really like the GoTo event. Uh, they are characterized by a very good audience. If you're very knowledgeable, uh, Jan and his team is, is, is getting to the right people. So I enjoy this a lot. Um, and this is a special thing because this is the first, first live event in a very, very long time. Yeah? So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Unity's role in the, in the AI ecosystem, um, how you know, the important role we play to advance AI. I'm going to use a lot of videos and, and examples um, uh, that looks a bit like games, but they're really just to, to illustrate some of the uh, important things that goes on behind the scenes, in the algorithms, and in the models being, being trained that are applicable to a variety of, 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 of other kind of business applications. Yeah? Uh, I, st I, I started, I created the machine learning team at Uber. I did the same thing at Amazon and at Microsoft. Uh, and all these organizations, they used machine learning uh, for their purposes. Yeah? Uh, what's unique about Unity is that we we sort of have the game engine, and, and I'm going to jump right into it uh, and, and basically answer the question, you know, wha what is it that's, so, that, that's so, so interesting with Unity and the game engine? Well, it's, it's the community is already using games and have been using games for a long time. Um, 70 years ago, uh, Claude Shannon wrote a, a chess program and wrote an article about it where he sort of uh, painted a vision of how AI was gonna do all kinds of good things in the future and he used this little chess playing program on a very very old <laughs> today very old and, and slow computer um, but it, it it allowed him to to think about some of the principles uh, behind AI yeah and um, Chinook um, is, is another program that was a, a, a milestone where we uh, we saw a, an algorithm were able to play a game uh, better than humans. Um, it was uh, a complex construct of a game. Uh, uh, later on, IBM Deep Blue, uh, when I, uh, I was actually at IBM at that point, um, beat Gag Kasparov. Um, and uh, we saw uh, IBM Watson uh, win Jeopardy. All these uh, systems are really examples of um, of software engineers and game specialists, uh, like in, in the Jeopardy case, basically building a Q&A database that 300 people curated with questions and answers, yeah? So that when you ran the game, it was just about finding the right, the right answer, l look it up and serve it faster than a human, yeah? Um, but with, um, with DeepMind's work in the, in the mid to late uh, 2000 teens uh, on playing Go, there was sort of a, a game changer, pun intended. Uh, they moved to generic learning algorithms, they moved to self-play and were able to train a system, train a computer, not, not build it, but train it to play the game better than the world champion. Yeah. And Alpha goes to zero, or Alpha Zero that followed AlphaGo uh, had zero human intervention. Yeah, so basically self-play against itself for 40 days, and then it would beat AlphaGo 100 games to zero yeah, without human interaction. Yeah, so nobody nobody gave it any hints. Yeah. So that that's a game changer. Yeah, and that has really led to to a lot of initiatives uh, in the industry of using various kind of games, video games, to progress uh, uh, AI. And so within these video games, what is that makes it so interesting? Uh, it's really four, four dimensions. So the first one is the visual dimension. So think about, think about all the animals around you, yeah? It's a vast majority of animals, they have, they have eyes, they have vision, they have senses, yeah? It is very beneficial to have sensors, yeah? Uh, so video games have that kind of vision component, yeah? To play most games, you have to see them, yeah? Um, they also have physics in them, yeah? So you're sort of moving around, there's gravity, there's uh, collisions, there's inertia, 
uh, there's some kind of laws that 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 keep you grounded literally yeah and then in video games there's also the cognitive side there are challenges there are puzzles there are stuff you have to solve to move to the next level yeah so not only do you have to see and walk around but you may also have to collect the right things in the right order and then finally is the social aspect you you play with other people or you play with with or against npcs yeah so non non player characters yeah so there's also that element in there so all those four elements or four dimensions are really what makes it so interesting to use a game engine as your your ai biodome you can you can basically create a virtual world and then you can test your algorithms or refine your algorithms you can basically build models within that world uh, and explore AI that way. So I'm going to talk about this. I've shown this many, many hundreds of times, but it, it's always a good starting point to talk about reinforcement learning, um, which is basically the way that nature works. Yeah. So uh, we make some observations, we take some actions, and we reap the penalties and rewards from it. Yeah. And when we do that in this flywheel, we get better and better at it, we move from an exploration mode to more of an exploitation mode, yeah? This is literally the most used algorithm at Amazon, yeah? This is what happens behind the Amazon website, yeah? Shows you stuff you click on, you don't click on stuff you buy, you don't buy, and the more you, you click and the more you look, the more this wheel spins and, and learns a lot about you, yeah? So that's that's sort of the core behind, behind uh, the secret behind Amazon, this is that um and i'm going to show you a little example of a chicken crossing the road uh using this technique um uh, the, the, the you can see the chicken is the ye little yellow thing there are the blue cars there are the gift uh, packages and there's going to be a computer controlling the chicken and it it it, it has four actions left right forward backward and then it's going to have a uh, some penalty if it gets hit by a car, it dies, and if it picks up a gift package, that a good, that's a good thing, yeah. And then it's going to start from scratch. We call that tabula rasa. So there's absolutely no insights here. It starts from nil. And as you can see, uh, it's just moving moving around here uh, in, in random patterns in a moment, yeah. So just forward, backward, sideways, it's just randomly exploring the, the space. But in a moment, it will pick up the gift package up there, right there, and then get hit by a car. Yeah. So 10 seconds, two bits of information, a good thing, a bad thing, and then keep doing that for half an hour, and you get pretty good at it. Yeah, You, uh, you can see that it actually has some strategies around sort of sometimes it stops and waits a little, and then it picks up gift packages. Um, uh, it's not perfect, but, you know, half an hour of, of, of training. Yeah. After six hours of training, it's a very different pattern, yeah. It becomes superhuman. And you have to remember, it's not, it's not like it sort of have seen this before. The cars are coming in randomly all the time, yeah. So what happened was that it generalized. It learned the policy, how to navigate the vehicles, pick up the gift packages, and not getting killed, yeah. You know why we put gift packages in there? It's to make it cross the road, yeah, because there are, there are going to be more gift packages out there in the future on the other side. So it will keep pursuing that and keep avoiding the cars, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so if you, if you start changing the conditions from what it has been trained on, um, that uh, can cause trouble. Uh, it happens in nature. Uh, there's actually a study that showed that that if you drive slowly up towards a bird on a roadway, it will fly away. But when you cross about 30 miles per hour, it will ignore you. Yeah, because it's not trained by nature to react to, 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 to anything that moves faster than that because it doesn't exist in nature. Yeah, it's a known problem. Um, so in this case here, you could uh, actually train the, the chicken to deal with, with a variety of speeds and stuff like that. Yeah but you could also exceed the speed and you will kill the chicken all the time, yeah. Um, 
So I'm going to show you some examples. They're all based on the same idea. It's all, all just by training and training. In this case, it's, it's balancing a ball on, on top of a cube. Uh, in this example, it's having a quadruped, which is really eight joints, eight little motors that need to work in a certain pattern uh, to walk forward, or have a humanoid learning to stand and balance. Anyone with little kids, they have seen this uh, around the age of, you know, one year old, something like that, yeah? Um, you can also have a human humanoid. So it's just, just again, it's like the chicken, yeah? It's like if you didn't say it should walk this way, but geometry and physics work that you need to walk that way, yeah? You can, of course, just like changing the, the speed of the vehicle, you can train them in an uneven terrain instead, yeah? So in this case, the 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 humanoid sort of can deal with with a uh, a changing terrain yeah and 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 again has generalized the ability to walk in 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 that terrain yeah um i also want to touch upon uh, sort of very natural things like curriculum learning which means that you learn the easy stuff first and then you move harder you, you move to the harder task la later on in this case here we train the agent to to push the blue agent needs to push an orange cube uh, to the um, to the target field, yeah. So here they are practicing, they're kind of learning that, and when they get really good at that, we move on and say, hey, there can be an an obstacle in between you. So now you you can't push it directly; you have to push it around something. So it's a little harder. And then at the end of the day, we want the agent to use the cube as a stepping stone, yeah. So when you can push it and you can push around stuff. You can also push it next to a wall and then use it as a jumping off point to, cr to, to get over the wall, yeah? This is something that we see in nature too, that you, 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 you go to first grade before you go to second, third, and before you go to high school, etc. It's basically to build the neural network, to build the patterns that are gonna be solid foundations for more and more complicated tasks, yeah? Um, works the same way in machines. Memory is another example. Uh, this is using a method uh, called LSTM. Uh, we don't tell the agent anything. We actually just say, uh, you use the right exit or use the wrong exit, yeah? If the, if the cube is orange, it should uh, use the orange exit. If it's red, use the red exit, yeah? But we don't tell it that. We just say yes or no when it exits. And quickly it finds out that the that the color matters, yeah. Not the size, not the location, only the color. Yeah. So it's an example of, of a future where these things, they learn what matters and learn to ignore what does not matter. Um, another example is, 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 this is the quadruped again, but now we use two models together because why not? Why not do what nature is doing, which is layer these models on top of each other? So one model is busy moving legs, and the other model is busy saying, go in this direction, targeting uh, the, the goal, the objective. Yeah? Um, which brings me on to attention. Um, it's uh, one of the, the, the big uh, things in, in recent years is that when you build machine learning systems, typically they like the chicken it sees the entire world. It sees what you see, yeah. but it's actually inefficient. So in this example here, you look at the agent and the, you can see the ray casting, that's the, the sensor. It's 360 until it identifies the cube that it needs to push. Then it needs to push it through an opening in a wall and it narrows the focus. It ignores everything that goes on around it, yeah? Uh, it's, it's kind of funny when you do autonomous vehicles, they have all these sensors on. And when I was at Uber, it would sense as much what's going on behind it as in front of it. And it had a three kilowatt nine blade computer in the trunk. Yeah? But most of the time, what really matters is kind of what you're driving into and much, much less what's behind you. Yeah? Uh, right now, we see a lot of examples uh, of, uh, of uh, machine learning algorithms that have a meta level to it. In this case here, this model has learned to ignore all the projectiles that's not going to hit it. So it will, fo it will just focus on uh, paying attention 
and avoiding the projectiles coming towards it, yeah. which means that you require much less uh, processing. So you can think about this in, in other contexts where we, we tend to, in machine learning, be very was wasteful, building very large models on very large amounts of data, and a lot of it doesn't actually matter. So if you imagine there's the two learnings in the model, one learning is what matters, and then use what matters to optimize. Yeah. Multi-agent, it's fascinating because we have, you have one agent doing things, but what if you have two or more, and they work together? In this case, these, these are actually pretty smart because they actually learn the trajectory of a projectile in a gravitational field. Actually, inside the machine learning model, it figured out how to compute where the projectile is going to land to hit it back. Yeah? Uh, in this case, you have two and two uh, indoor soccer. You should notice that one of the players take a defensive role while the other is offensive. It's nothing that we ask them to do. They're all equal. But after a million game plays, that's the pattern that really pays off. And if you, if you put more players in game, it becomes more clear that one or more, well actually one really becomes a goalie. They're just standing in front of the goal all the time. And the others are trying to attack and a little defensive, yeah? And you can also notice that if, if the goalie gets the ball and moves up, one of the others move down and become the new goalie. Yeah, it's very dynamic. We call that emergent behavior. We didn't instruct them to play that way. We just let them play millions of games, and then it turns out that if you play this method, you win more. Yeah. Lastly, this one was inspired uh, of me getting a bee sting, and then the, th the stinger from the bee was back in my finger, and now the bee is going to die. And I was like, why did you do that? Yeah, why did you commit suicide stinging me <laughs> and then dying? Yeah? There's absolutely no benefit for that bee to die. So we did a small game. Um, there are three agents and a dragon. The dragon has the key to get out of the room. To get the dragon, you have to, <laughs> you have to, you have to, uh, to sacrifice yourself. So one of the agents will sacrifice itself to get the key away from the dragon so one of the other agents can unlock the door. Yeah. This is what the bees, they're doing, yeah? One bee sacrifices itself for the species, yeah? That's why we keep away from bees. Yeah? It's beneficial for bees to sting and die once in a while because it keeps the species uh, stronger, yeah? Uh, this is uh, an example where it's non-trivial because uh, when you write an algorithm and you give it an objective function, uh, all agents will try to survive all the time. Yeah? So you have to give them other ways of uh, having a value, uh, a, a value function for all the agents and figure out that the best all the agents can do to solve this problem is to sacrifice one of them. Uh, I got this video from a professor from University of Washington saying, yeah, 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 this reinforcement learning and deep learning, my hamster is much, much smarter. And literally he tweeted and said, well, your machine learning model cannot do this. And I had to respond with this one, which is the agent trying to jump over the wall and see what it did. <laughs> yeah because that was actually the easiest. The developer forgot to, to sort of make the site solid, yeah? Uh, so, uh, so even traits like, we see this all the time, we see the hamster doing this, we see dogs doing stuff, but when we, when we simulate this, we see some of the same behavior by a very simple model running on a laptop, yeah? Which is sort of disappointing, because sometimes we think the hamster is really smart, yeah? It's really smart. Well, maybe, it Maybe we have a lot of functions like that in us that are very, very simple functions. And we just do stuff, and then afterwards we explain the world, or we explain to ourselves why we did it. But in fact, we just did it. Yeah. It's after rationalization. Yeah. So, uh, data. So I've been at this for a long time, and what I found is that we have more laws for data in AI, which is that about every 18 months, the amount of training data doubles. 
just more and more and more. Yeah. And the other thing we found is that when you double every 18 months, you cannot gather enough data in the real world. Yeah. Uh, it's impossible. You're going to run out of data because it's just not, it's going to be hand labeled, there's going to be people behind it, uh, there's going to be, it's going to cost too much energy, too much CO2 to collect all that data. Yeah. So, what, what, what we have to think about is to take the game engine and it runs at 30 frames per second for a game because that's, that's a good uh, frame rate for, for the human eye. Um, but when, when you run a simulation, it's, uh, it's for another computer. Yeah. So why not run as fast as you can? Yeah? Uh, you are alive if you carry a handicam with you or whatever, you know, Google glasses, soon Apple glasses maybe. Um, and you record your life at 30 frames per second for an entire year. That's a billion frames. Yeah. So we can, we, can, we can run faster than 30 frames per second. Yeah. We can run maybe 5,000 frames per second in a game engine on a good server in a cloud infrastructure. Yeah. And we can run a lot of them, yeah. which means that if I can generate billions of frames that corresponds to many, many years of data, yeah? So that's, that's what's happening. Um, simulating a universal robot like this, uh, you can have a lot of robots learning to touch objects. I don't have to code my robot, I just put a machine learning model in that I trained through simulation, yeah? Um, at uni uh, in, in the Unity, uh, engine we added a pack that allows you to actually to import robot descriptions so you get unity will build the robot based on that manufacturer's description and then you can simulate it and then you can actually let the robot in the real world do it and if you simulate accurate enough the real world robot will do the same yeah and you can imagine how slow a real world robot is how often it breaks how expensive it is but but if you can explain, if you can experiment with half a million dollar robots in a simulation, you can actually try to see if you can even, if you're a robotic startup, you can, uh, you can try to see if you can even solve a problem before you invest in the robot, yeah. You can basically build the digital twin of your problem domain, deploy your robot in it and try it out, yeah. So we're doing a lot of work uh, with, uh, one of our biggest customers is DeepMind. They have a very large team of engineers building Unity environments for their thousand research, uh, doing things that I just showed you here and, and many more complex things. We have OpenAI using Unity and the uh, Allen Institute, which was founded by uh, Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen. And they're all using Unity for things like this. This is OpenAI, a camera, sees the hand and the cube, go through a machine learning model that controls the hand. So it's a, it's a, it's it's a hand-eye coordination, yeah? That's how it flips the cubes. You can see how slowly it moves. They did that in Unity using, th um, uh, how many is it? 300 billion frames, 300 billion frames. How many years of experience is that? 300 years. 300 years of experience, yeah? Then let's try to flip Rubik's Cube instead, single-handed. It's not solving the cube. There's a simple algorithm for that, but just getting that cube turned single-handedly, that took 10 trillion frames of training, yeah? So that's 10,000 years of training in Unity. Take the model you produce and put it in front of a robotic hand, yeah? Here we have LG, Lucky Goldstar. This is an uh, autonomous vehicle simulator. Uh, you drive the vehicle in different kinds of weather, different kinds of uh, traffic situations. And then you generate the RGB camera, the infrared camera, the depth camera, the segmentation information, the LiDAR. I can keep going on. You generate all that. Uh, to train your autonomous vehicle before you even think of taking it on the road. Yeah. This is a very interesting uh, example here from DeepMind. It's AlphaFold. 
using the techniques I've shown today, learning to, to fold protein sequences to predict the folding. Yeah? Um, the very important thing in this is um, that they trained a machine learning model to understand what parts of the sequence matters. So when humans do this, we write algorithms that sort of traverse this, the, this, the, the sequence um, uh, and then try to sort of fold it. It's really complicated and we get it right in these algorithms that have been 30 years underway, about right 50% of the time. Uh, AlphaFold gets it right, AlphaFold 2 gets it right 90% of the time. The important difference here is that the 30 years we spent in these algorithms was based on understanding of the chemical bindings and the physics behind it. In AlphaFold 2, it's a deep learned model with 20 million parameters that figured it out, just like some of the examples I show you where the racket player can figure out where the ball is going to be, but we didn't tell it, it computed it somewhere in there. This is the same here, it figures out how these things fold, but it doesn't tell us how. Yeah. Another example is this one, it's a, it's, it's a very simple example. You train a, a what we call a generative net, a, a GAN, a GAN, we train that on existing weather data. So a lot of weather data, a lot of examples. No understanding of the meteorological, uh, you know, things going on here. Yeah. Just pure graphical. And then what you can do is that you can basically feed it 20 minutes of real world data and it will predict the weather 90 minutes out as a graphical thing, not understanding the physics of weather prediction, and it will beat all existing algorithms 85% of the time. Yeah. Which brings me to this idea here, that we have these single agents operating with each other. Yeah. You saw the Saga example. And it's sort of very atomic actions. The agent hit the ball and the ball rolled, stuff like that. Yeah? Or an agent stand in the way of another agent. Yeah? And then you put them together and you get systems. Yeah? We saw one agent moving to become a goalie while the others are attacking. We didn't predict that. I didn't know that. Yeah? We just let it play. Actually, we, we did another example of dodgeball. A dodgeball, it's in, in Danish, it's holding a ball. And we made hours of recording, and we identified by sitting and watching it seven different strategies that these agents develop to win the game. Seven different strategies, yeah? So when you put these agents together and they play together, you, you get system dynamic interactions, and then you study that and you get understanding, and then we feed it right back into the system and say, maybe we need to tweak this or tweak that so that they perform better or something or we get a better understanding what's going on which brings me to my last slide um, oh sorry and that's that's the feedback loop yeah so that that's sort of the key of AI I need always need to have the feedback loop I need to go back and and be better that's how nature works yeah um, which brings me to the last slide which is sort of think about this it can be it can be science it can be engineering it can be uh, business model planning, business modeling. It can be doing business. There's sort of um, the infinite space of, of knowledge. We don't know. That's big, yeah. It's fuzzy. We don't know how much that is, yeah. But it in within that, we can simulate stuff and, 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 and get a handle on what's going on in there using simulation, using artificial intelligence. And then within that, there's a sub-place I, I gave you an example of weather forecasting that, or, or, or protein folding, yeah, that we know this, but we can simulate and train an AI to actually know more than we do. Yeah? And then, of course, in the very middle, that is sort of the recorded knowledge, yeah? knowledge up to this point. Yeah? Um, a lot of companies like uh, 
Facebook is getting a lot of flack these days, yeah, for misinformation and all that. It's it's not like they was it's not like Mark Zuckerberg said you know ten years ago we can have a lot of misinformation on Facebook and we're gonna get people to click on it and we're gonna make a lot of money. I bet nobody said that. I know they didn't. Yeah. What they said was that let's get these algorithms run. Okay? You're the all the little agents and you're clicking and clicking and clicking and the algorithm figures out what works. Yeah. And what it figured out is of course that. One thing is sharing happiness and happy pictures of kids and cats and dogs and they get likes. But what's even better is angry stuff. Gets way many more likes or hates and shares. It's like, look what this idiot is saying, yeah? So the algorithm, if you think about this, yeah, <laughs> went beyond what the founders of these companies thought they were doing, yeah? Because the algorithm took over and it also generated a lot of money. So nobody's going to say, oh, stop, yeah? Uh, but I think it's very important to think about that in business, in science, and engineering, that when algorithms get really good, stuff happens, and there will be a lot of surprises, yeah? And with, with that, I'm going to go to the final slide, you know, feel free to connect and follow, and watch out for those vacuum cleaners at home. Thank you very much.